start praying those prayers again and believe he won't nothing is impossible with it he won't fail he won't fail let's just stay here and thank you Lord that we can believe again this morning that we can receive again this morning we can stand on you again this morning. You're everything, Jesus. You are the way maker. You are the God of open doors. And we receive this morning. We receive in our hearts. We receive in our minds. We stand on
that is hidden from you, Lord. You know it all, Lord God. You are, you are the highest of the high, Lord. You are the King of kings, and you are the Lord of lords. We worship you this morning, Lord. The Word of God says that the entire earth will be filled with the glory of God. That every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether here or in eternity, that's the truth. He is a great God. He is a mighty God. He loves you. He loves me. We worship you, Lord God. The Bible speaks of when God's people they praise and when they worship and they came together and declared the goodness of God and His love and they sacrificed and trumpeters trumpeted, singers sang how the glory of the Lord filled the temple and God's presence His glory is in this place today church won't you raise your hands just acknowledge him this morning. We acknowledge you, Lord God. Close your eyes, lift your hands, stand, kneel, whatever it is, before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning. All the earth will shout your praise. We will declare that he is a great God, that he is a mighty God. Come on, all the earth will shout whether today, tomorrow, or in eternity, can we raise our voices for Him this morning? Can we worship Him for who He is, for His greatness? Say, God looks good on you. Once you greet five more people, give them a high five. 
welcome them to church. Say you're looking good this morning. You're looking good. Amen. What a time in the presence of God. Amen. Come on. You, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You have to, you and I have to experience the presence of God for ourselves. Amen. And isn't he good? Amen. Awesome church. Well, we want to welcome you this morning. If it's your first time with us here at City Life Church, Clear Water Mall, we don't want to make you feel spare or awkward. We just want you to wave your hand for a moment. We want to welcome you, let you know that you are loved in this place. If that is you, won't you wave your hand in the air. Welcome over there. Welcome over here. Wave it like you just do care. <laughs> we love you. God bless you. Our hosts are going to bring a card around. It's a welcome card. If you could fill that out, pop it in the offering basket when he comes around. We just want to get in touch with you, pray with you, find out if there's anything uh, that you need that we can just stand in agreement with you. We want to love on you. Please feel free to join us in the foyer uh, at the welcome desk. There's a great coffee station just next to it, uh, and you can share a cup of coffee with us. Amen. Well, welcome. It is so good to have you with us. Well, church, it's time for the offering. That's right. God loves a cheerful giver. This morning, I'm going to read a scripture. And it is from Mark chapter 14, verse 3 to 9. And it says, And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, and speaking about Jesus, as he sat around the table, a woman came having an alabaster an alabaster, depending on where you come from, flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And that was worth about a year's wages. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do good to them. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Amen. Come on, what? an extravagant expression of giving from this woman. You know, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever given extravagantly? You know, it caused a bit of a stir amongst people. And it said in, in, in one of the other translations, it says they called it criminal, that they said this is a sheer waste. They were angry at her. Why are you doing that? Don't you know that's wages? Don't you know you could give that to the poor? Don't you know? You know, in my mind, I'm like, dudes, like, it's not your oil, you know? Why are you angry at her for what she is doing, what she believes to do right in her heart, you know? And it just got me thinking, you know, somebody could easily look at, you know, people who give and who are extravagant in the church and say, well, why, well, why do you go to church on a Sunday? You know, why do you have to go on a Tuesday as well, the prayer meeting? And what about a Thursday, you know? I mean, we've had family members that go like, why are you going to church on Christmas? Can't we have Christmas dinner early or, I mean, breakfast or whatever it is, you know? And, and of course, people don't understand. When you, have, when you have a love for your Savior, when you have such a desire to please Him, when you have been in the grave and raised from the dead like a, Raz, a Lazarus, you understand the value of our King. If you've ever been afflicted in your mind, tormented by demons or on drugs in a dark place, you will understand the value of our Savior. Amen. If you were like a Paul who said, you know, I once persecuted the church. I once was in a place of complete 
darkness and I hated Christians. I hated the church. But I've seen the light. I've had a revelation of who God is. You cannot but help and go, Lord, have my everything. Take it all. You've got my heart. You've got my mind. You've got my soul. You've got my finances. If you've never been in that place, the Bible says, he who has been forgiven much will love much. Church, we have all been forgiven much. You know, in our Western world, it's easy to think, you know what, I don't need God. I can get by with my intellect. Medical advances are so good these days. But I think we all know that at some point, those things run out. And you recognize that I need a savior. I need someone to rescue me from the pit. And when you and I understand the value of our savior, no one can judge our sacrifice. No one can judge our giving. I keep thinking about a man in our church who has passed on, who had a piece of land, one of the members from Clearwater, you know, when, when the church first started, he passed on to be with the Lord, but what a legacy he's left. And, and, and his friends and people were saying, you know, he and his wife recognized that the church was in need. They had a piece of land and they said, you know what? We can take, we can sell this and we can give extravagantly to the kingdom of God because our heart is in it. We know that it's valuable for people, you and I, who are going to come for generations and this will be called the house of God. This will be where people will be set free. This is where life will begin for somebody. Amen. And that is you and I. So when we give, church, let's give out of a heart that knows who our Savior is. Amen. We have to experience Him. We cannot be neutral in this world. He is all-powerful, all-knowing. He wants to encounter you. The Bible says He's not far from every single one of us. To anyone who calls on His name, He will answer. Amen. And He is our God who provides every single one of our needs. As we give, let's give out of a love and if it's out of sacrifice, know that your Savior sees this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray, and then we're going to take up the offering. Father, we thank you for your goodness in our lives. We thank you for the great gift of salvation that you have given to us, Lord. We recognize the value of Jesus Christ in our lives, the one who came to preach good news to the poor, the one who came to set the captive free. We once were blind. And now we see, Lord God, come and have your will and way. Let these finances bless your people, bless the kingdom. Extend its borders, Lord God, to touch every single heart, mind and soul in this nation and in this world. And let the earth, the entire earth, be filled with the glory of God this morning. And a faithful people said, amen. amen. Come on, I think we can give a better amen than that. Amen. 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 Come on. God is good. Church, there are many ways to give. Bank details on the screen. Snap scan facilities, card facilities in the foyer afterwards. Let's give knowing who we serve. Amen. Can we all stand this morning? We're going to sing a song of praise unto our God. Yeah, as we give, let's know that God sees it this morning.
You can take your seats again. We just want to let you know that we have an incredible children's ministry that looks after our kids, ministers to them. So if you have any youngsters between the age of 3 and 12, take a look at this on the screen. <laughs> they have a fantastic time. Can we give our children's ministry volunteers a round of applause, all our kids? our children. One more round of applause for them. Awesome. Well, church, turn your attention to the screens once again for this week's news. Hey church, welcome. It is so good to have you with us. This year we're going deeper in our devotion with God and growing more intimately in our relationship with Jesus. Why not join us for our prayer meeting 
this Tuesday, the 23rd of April from 6 to 7 p.m. at our Lone Hill location. It's going to be a powerful time of prayer and worship in God's presence. You won't be sorry. Come through, make it part of your rhythm for this year, and it's going to be absolutely powerful. That's right. Hey Church, our current Joseph Project initiative is called Warm and Fed. With winter just around the corner, we'll be collecting some essential items for those in need to help them navigate the cold season. Yeah. So during April and May, we'll be collecting blankets, jerseys, scarves, beanies, as well as soup sachets. So if you would like to bring any of these items and partner with us to make a difference in your community, then you can bring them through to the welcome desk or drop them off at the Joseph Pantry drop-off trolley every Sunday. That's right. I love that we get to make a difference in our community. Hey, I have a question. Do you feel more connected and plugged in to your church community? Well, if not, there's a great way for you to do so. Why not consider joining one of our volunteer teams this year? There's so many great ways for you to serve in City Kids, the cafe, um, technical teams, setup teams, hosting teams, hosting teams, welcome worship desk, team, worship teams. Yeah. So many, so many ways for you to get involved. Uh, why not go by, by the welcome desk after the encounter to register or email? info at citylifechurch.co.za. We can't wait to serve alongside you. That's right. And if you love adventure and the great outdoors, why not join us for our next church hike, which will be taking place at the Walter Sisulu Botanical Gardens on Saturday, the 27th of April at 8 a.m. The cost is only 80 Rand per person and you can bring along a picnic blanket and a picnic basket and have a little pre-winter picnic straight after the hike. We look forward to seeing you there. Unfortunately, that's all our church news for today. Have a fantastic encounter. An awesome Sunday, and we'll see you again next week. I hold in my hand today a brick because I believe this morning that the Lord would release into this room a message that this season is different from other seasons because the season is a construction season. You see, the reality is a brick on its own is ordinary. A brick on its own is neutral. This brick right now has the ability to construct or deconstruct. It has the ability to build or to break down. You see, the reality is that this brick can be used to build something significant for the glory of the Lord, but it depends in whose hands the brick is found. Bricks have been used for generations, for thousands of years to build palaces and places of residence for rulers who rule and reign across nations. Bricks have been used to build buildings, to construct industries, to instruct places of employment, that those places would leverage the resource wealth of generations. A brick can be used to build. It depends in whose hand we place that brick. Even today, our place of residence, the place that we call home, is a place made by bricks. It's a place of solitude, a place of significance that we're able to raise a family, we're able to do, to think, to breathe, to rest, to find our place in this world. You see, on its own, a brick can do very little. But God has the ability to take that which is ordinary and make it into something extraordinary. Today in this room, I want to tell you that you and I, according to the Word of God, we are bricklayers. And we can choose to build things on our own, to build our kingdom, to build our wealth, to build up to us my thoughts, my desires, my things all. Today we can make a choice that I am going to be part of the master engineer, the chief designer, that I don't want to live my one and only life for the glory of me just for a small legacy, 
but I want to build something that counts, a life of significance, a life that makes a difference, a life that leverages all that He placed in me, in my soul, in who I am, in my thoughts. And I know this morning that there are many here today who would not have a revelation that it wasn't the alarm clock that got you up this morning. It was God Himself who brought you from a place of unconsciousness to a place of consciousness. He put on you a mandate. He put in you gifts, talents, abilities, and a calling that in the hands of the master designer, of the chief builder, you would accomplish much. But I know this morning, as I look around this room, that many of us today would feel the weight of a construction season because what is in place now feels like it's out of place. What should be in a place of progression in a year of open doors, it feels like it's dusty, out of place, everything in its wrong place. But I know this morning that there are people in this room today that if you looked and reflected on your life, it feels like a number of strings just hanging in limbo, hanging out of place, hanging with responsibilities, with an agenda. I know that there are many people in this room today who would say, you know what, I can deal with a few things, but right now I'm having to deal with a lot of things. I'm talking about emails. I'm talking about appointments. I'm talking about dealing with things that haven't happened that should have happened. I know this morning in this place that there are people here today that would say, Lord, I could deal with this many, but with that many, I don't know if I can stand anymore. But I've got a word of encouragement for you today that there is a chief engineer, a master designer who was before all things and in him all things hold together. And for those of you dangling the strings, if you would place them in His hands, if you would choose to build with Him, He'll say that I will take the strings and I will make a tapestry of something significant with your life, through your life, around your life right now. But Lord, I don't know my next step. Trust in the one who holds your next step. But Lord, I don't have a solution. Believe in the one that has a solution through all things. But God, I'm feeling so weak. I'm feeling so down. I'm depressed. I'm despondent. I'm in a place of despair that he today would say to you, I've got you. I will be your strength. Because when you are weak, then I am strong. For my power is made perfect in your weakness today in this place would you choose are you going to build for you are you going to allow the master designer the chief engineer to begin to build something in this construction season in this room right now there are people that are handling the strings what feels like too much I want you to lift your hand if that's you this morning I want to pray for you even right now. Father, I thank you, God, for every honest person with their hand raised in this place. I thank you, God, that you are right there in the middle of the storm, in the place of heaviness, that, God, you would say right now to each and every person with their hand raised today, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm going to lift up what you can't lift up. I'm going to take control. Would you trust me when things feel out of place because I'm about to put them in the correct place. I'm about to shift some things. I'm about to move some things. I'm about to do a miracle. But in the middle of the construction, it feels like a disaster. Would you trust me right now? And there are people with their hands raised this morning who would say, God, I come from such an ordinary background. My family never achieved much. 
but I want to tell you from ordinary genealogy, you have kingdom authority to call those things that are not as if they were, to release faith in the room because faith pleases God. Faith impresses God. Faith causes God to move mightily on your behalf. And Father, right now over every hand raised in this place, I speak, Father, a release of your power because it's not your strength. It's not your might. It's not you worrying all night. It's about Him. It's about His grace. It's about living in a culture of microwaves and instant food, fast food, fast television, fast internet, that there is a God who will journey with you in the process. He's got you in the process. It may feel slow. It may feel like it's never gonna end, but I wanna tell you, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, behold, that is not your landing place. That is not your permanent residency because He's about to release you into green pastures by still waters. Would you trust Him in a season of construction? Father, right right now we release Your Word, God. We thank You, Lord, that You're here. We thank You, God, that You've been all over worship this morning. You're even here right now, Lord. My words do not have the power to do much, but one word from You, God, can change everything. I thank you, God, for a room of faith. I thank you, God, for a people who got up this morning, had a choice to stay in bed, had a choice to let the weather affect them, but they said, you know what? I need a word from God. I need a promise from God. I'm gonna be found and I'm gonna be found faithful in the house of God. And God says, there is a blessing. There is a reward for those who seek me will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. In this room, Father, there is a heart cry that says, God, we are hungry for you. God, we are thirsting for you. Would you come and have your way in Jesus' name? And everybody said, Amen, amen, amen. Come on, can we give the Lord a shout of praise? He's worthy. I got a word this morning, but I really wanted to preface it with this idea that there is a master builder. And sometimes in these construction seasons, it's hard. Anyone ever seen a place around you, a home, a a building project? We've got one by our house. It's just like they were building and they stopped. And some of us project that stopping on what God's doing because we can't always see what He's doing. But God says, I do things in the secret. I do things underground that will be revealed overground if you just walk in faithfulness right now. I want to encourage you to stand in this place. We're going to read the Word of God. Michaela is going to read the Word of God for me. Come on. Let's give it up for Michaela. Judges 1 verse 1 to 7. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be the first to go up against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the lad into his hand. So Judah said to Simon, his brother, Come up with me to my allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanites. I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simon went with him. Then Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek and fought against him. They, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then Adonai Bezek fled and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table, and I have done so God has repaid me. Repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Luke ten verse one. After these things the Lord appointed seventy others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Luke ten verse seventeen. Then 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Well done. Well done. Fantastic.
fantastic. You can give someone around you a high five, tell them looking good, come on, looking good, and you can take your seat. I had a couple of ideas for the message today. Um, I'm calling it Built because it'll look better online as the name Built, but you could also call the message today Thumbs and Toes, and what we're doing is we're taking two passages, one from Judges, one in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, and then comparing to a passage found in Luke chapter to 10 in the new covenant. And I want to take both those pictures and bring a new Testament reality of a type and shadow of what's happening in this passage. Thumbs and toes. Give someone around you a thumbs up this morning. And we've got this guy and his name is Adonai Bezek. It's where we probably got the word berserk. <laughs> that guy would be cray cray people. And so the children of Judah, they get this guy, Adonai Bezek, they capture him and the Bible tells us that they cut off his thumbs and his big toes because this king and ruler had captured 70 good kings, 70 people, and he too had cut off their thumbs and their toes. And the Bible tells us that he fed them scraps under his table. In other words, he kept them chained and captured under the table of this king. You see, this king, he had an assignment to take out other kings. He knew that if I can take out kings, I can take out everything connected to that king. In other words, if I can defeat kings, I can take out the family of those kings. If I can keep a king in bondage, then anything associated with that king is kept in a place of bondage. I want you to see something today from the Old Testament with New Testament eyes because in the book of Revelation, chapter one, verse five, it says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, that's important. God is saying that Jesus, the firstborn, what, is king of kings. He's king over all the kings. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us, what, kings and to the glory of God and the Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. You see, we need a, a New Testament revelation that Jesus says that you and I are kings and a royal priesthood. You see, the enemy has a mandate because the enemy cannot stop what Jesus has already accomplished for us on the cross, that we have an enemy. He cannot stop the work of the cross, but the enemy has a revelation. If I can take out the kings, I can take down the kingdom. And so we've got this king, Adonai Bezek, a type and shadow of a New Testament position that Jesus has placed us in. Adonai Bezek is a representation of the devil, the enemy. You see, the Old Testament says that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he came down with the law that he found the people worshiping idols. And the Bible says that 3,000 were taken out in that moment. Fast forward to the New Testament, the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, there came the sound of a rushing wind. And all who were in the upper room were filled with the Spirit of God. And the Bible says that Peter, under the power of what? The Holy Spirit began to minister and 3,000 people were added to their number. Because why is that? In the Old Testament, the arrival of the law, 3,000 perish. The New Testament, the arrival of the Spirit and 3,000 are saved. Why is that? Because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We need a revelation in this place that when it comes to the 70, Adonai Bezek, he captured 70 kings, a type
type and shadow of what Jesus would do in his ministry. What happens in the New Testament? Jesus comes and he releases 70 kings. Those that were bound, he empowers them and they come back with this revelation. Even the devils, even the demons will obey us in the name of Jesus. I want to tell you today that as a New Testament believer, Jesus came to set free and liberate what the devil had tried to keep bound in this time. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise? Come on. What's interesting to reaffirm this picture that King Adonai Bezek was a type and shadow of the devil is that Adonai Bezek actually means the Lord of lightning. Well, I find that interesting because in the New Testament, Jesus comes and he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. There's a picture right there. Come on. You see the strategy of the enemy will always be the same, even more so in this day and age. The enemy wants to take down kings. He wants to take down your heavenly position of what Jesus has already done. And so I wanna look very quickly at four things from this passage that the enemy perpetually tries to do with us. The first one is that the enemy will always try to dethrone you. You see, right now as you sit here today, you are a king under the king of kings. See, never be ignorant of the position that Christ has positioned you in. You see, we've been focusing, excuse me, on this for a little while now. Never drink sparkling water before you preach. It's bound to come back right there. The reality is we've focused on this a lot, but I have really felt to re-emphasize this, that in the book of Ephesians, it says that Jesus was raised up above all powers and principalities and seated next to the Father on his right-hand side, and every enemy becomes his stool, his footstool. You see, that's great for Jesus, but in Ephesians 2 verse 6, it says that you and I have been raised with Christ and are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. We need a revelation that the devil has no authority over the born again believer today. You are not a victim, you are a victor. Hello. You are not a tragedy, you are triumphant. Hello. You are not, you are the head and not the tail. You're going over not not under, you're above and not beneath. You're elevated to a place that is higher than your adversary, higher than his schemes and higher than the methods that he would use. See, the devil, it's by no coincidence that in the book of Genesis, the devil is pictured as a serpent. The one thing about a serpent, if you've ever seen a snake in nature, they have the ability to hide in very small spaces. They have an ability to come between a rock and a hard place. The devil will always try and squirm his way between that which God has promised you and that which is fulfilled over you. And between the promise that we receive and the promise that we see is the place where the devil will always try and come in between. See, we we need a revelation today that there are some things that God this year has placed your name on it. And he wants to see, are you more passionate about it than having a fear of what the devil's up to in the middle of the storm? You see, when I read the gospel of Mark, we find that Jesus had a mandate from heaven to go and deliver a man who had been plagued by 2,000 demons. And As Jesus left land upon the water to get to the other side, it says in Mark 4, the Bible says that the enemy stirred up the waters. He stirred up a storm between what Jesus' present position was and the word he'd received from his father to go and release someone. 
Every promise you have in your life today between the promise received and the promise realized is a space that the devil will try and throw the storm at you. Some of you today are in the middle of the storm. You're in a good place because the promise is about to be released on your life in Jesus' name. Don't let the devil squirm too long in that position. Jesus knew what to do when the storm came up. The uncertainty came up. The thoughts with his disciples, will we even get to where we need to go? Jesus slept on the boat. Jesus had a peace. Jesus had a revelation that if God has promised it, ain't no devil from hell gonna keep it from me getting what God's promised in Jesus' name. Jesus stands up on the boat. He rebukes the storm. He speaks to the winds and he tells them to die down in that moment. He arrives on the shore and let me help you. Jesus never once in his ministry asked the devil for permission to release someone. He never said, devil, how are you doing? Would you mind? Would it be okay with you? Is it all right if you would rather leave this woman alone? Devil, excuse me, hello. Can you please just leave and maybe walk away? Jesus never asked permission from the devil. I want you to see that. He arrived and the devil trembled. The devil came knowing that he was already defeated and he says, please don't send us from the region. Jesus says, what is your name? The devil responds, legion, for we are many. One Jesus. 2,000 demons, one word, and the enemy had to flee in Jesus' name. Some of us need to realign our theology regarding demonology in that the devil is a defeated foe. Too many of us would say, you know what, the devil, he's in my house, he's attacking me, he's doing this. At the name of Jesus, every demon in hell has to flee because all power that Jesus had when he took the keys of death and the grave, he empowered you with where there is light, there can be no darkness. Hello, when a demon's there at the name of Jesus, the demon has to flee, come on. And we're living in a day and an age, oh, Christian, and he's got a, this, this, uh, not Christian, the preacher, come on. Christians, that they have this theology that, oh, I'm limping today, there's a demon on my back, you know. I don't know where that theology, because at the name of Jesus, the devil has snaked his way in, into a perception that he's more powerful than the name that God has already empowered you with. And I want you to see this. The devil comes and he knows he's defeated and he says, please don't send me from this region. Why is that? Because the devil has been assigned to regions to inhibit the promise that God already has for you. Some of us need a revelation that the reason it's been so hard in the season is there is a demon that's managing a geographic that at the name of Jesus, he has to move. He has to leave. Hello, you are a king. How did Jesus win? He spoke a word. Kings today, speak a word. Priests today, speak a word. Because when you speak a word, the devil has to flee in Jesus' name. Come on. We need a revelation today that the devil has no power. He has no authority. Why is that? He took over a region. Some of you are on the breakthrough of a region in your industry. You're in breakthrough of a region in your vocation. In other words, the area where God has called you to work right now, the devil, that's why there's jealousy in your place of work. That's why there's naysayers trying to speak smack about you to their work colleagues to try and destroy you reputationally. You do not retaliate to a man. Why? Because you're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms above every power and authority. No, I need only remain still knowing that my 
God is working behind the scenes. Come on. That's why it's people come to church and they'll say, you know what? Uh, how are you doing? I've seen you around. Yeah, uh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I've just finished an engineering degree. Wow, that's amazing. I have an engineering company. Why don't you come and see me on Monday? There's connections. Why? Because God has already said in a year of open doors, in a year of wide open spaces, I am releasing territory to you that was previously withheld from you. Would you hold on and be passionate about the promise and not let some mere simple irrelevant devil try and take you from it in Jesus' name? The first thing the devil wants to do is he wants to dethrone you. Number two, the devil wants to disable you. Disarm you, sorry. I'm sure it says disarm on the screen. The devil wants to disarm you. King Adonai Bezek, the Bible says, most obscure passage of the, of, in Scripture. I doubt many of you have heard a sermon about thumbs and toes. But King Adonai Bezek, he went and he took the thumbs of the 70 kings. What is a thumb useful for? Without a thumb, you have no ability to grip what God has given you. Without a thumb, there is no ability to hold on to that which you need to hold on to. See, in Bible times, the reason in the Old Testament he would take the thumbs of kings is by taking the thumb of a king that he would restrict their ability to hold on to a sword. Well, Ephesians 6 tells us that for you and I as Christ-centered believers, that we too have a sword. It's called the Word of God. When the devil wants to come and cut off your thumb, it's the reality is he wants to take your grip away from the promise and the Word that God has already given you in this season. Come on. The enemy wants to take the promise and make it not come to pass. He wants you to let go of the promise because, and get this, I know what it's like, of how long it's taking. When God gives you a word, a promise, it's often accompanied with a battle. The way you wage a battle is you hold on with all your might to the word of God in that season. There is a difference between a promise received and a promise received possessed. There is often a battle to fight. The children of Israel went through a wilderness before they occupied the promised land. There is always a battle in the middle. It's a faith battle. Come on. It's what they have said about you. It's an economic outlook. It's an economic condition that's happening in our nation pre-May 29th. Everyone is holding back, but I serve a God who releases when organizations are holding holding back. Come on. See, God has the ability to release when others would hold on. See, God sent me today to tell you, hold on. The promise he's given is about to come through in Jesus' name. Eleazar, when we read in the book of Samuel, he's out there swinging swords. He's out fighting a battle. The Bible says that Eleazar, he's holding on with all of his might. In the first book of Samuel, he's fighting a battle. The battle goes on so long that even Eleazar's own men began to give up, to get weary and to retreat. But the Bible says Eleazar held even the more onto his sword and the Lord came through and brought a significant victory from him. He was outnumbered. The odds were against him. One translation says that he welded his hand to his sword. Some of you here today that are weary, I want to ask you, would you become welded? Or well, those of you who are tired right now, would you take strength from the word of God that what God has promised will come to pass in the name of Jesus? If you're weary today, if you're slipping today, hold on. God is faithful. He will fulfill it. Come on. He's going to fulfill the promise concerning your marriage. Hello. Concerning your kids concerning that business that's on shaky ground. Well, if Christ is in it, you are on solid ground in Jesus' name. The next thing, King uh, Adonai Bezek, he comes and he cuts off the big toes 
of the men. <laughs> what happens? Anyone ever had an ingrown t- toenail? Infected toenail? Anyone? Am I the only one in this room with my hand up? I see one of us, two of us. Come on. How many of you know when a toenail is infected, you are not able to walk as you normally would walk. They tell us by removing a big toe, the ability to walk is highly compromised. What happened? The third thing that the devil would try and do to you is he would try and disable you. Number three, disable you. Number one, dethrone you. Number two, disarm you. Number three, disable you. See, the kings at the time, without their big toes, would have become unstable. In other words, they would have become unstable in all things of where they were called to rule and reign, church. In the year 2024, come on. Some of us are becoming unstable when it comes to living a separated life with God. In the book of Joshua 7, verse 12, it says, Therefore, I want you to get the context. The children of Israel could not, what? Stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before the enemies because they had become doomed to destruction. What's the context there? The children of Israel, it felt like their big toes had been cut off. They were had no ability to stand against the enemy. What had happened? There was a gentleman in their camp called Achan. What Achan had done is when they had last won a battle, he had gone into their camp, taken something that was unclean, removed it when God said, leave it, and he had placed it in his tent. The Bible tells me that the Holy Spirit dwells in our tent. In other words, we are the tent or the temple of the Holy Spirit. What had Achan done? He brought that which was unclean into his place of residence. You see, the Bible tells us that actually we are saved by grace. You have already been accepted by Christ. But that does not mean that we go on sinning. Hello? Hello? You are called holy because Jesus has made you holy. But does your life reflect the holiness of the reality of what Jesus has already done in your life? There are people that stand with no stability. One foot in the world, one foot in the church, one foot and times will tell. Emotions will tell. They're on shaky ground. No stability, no standards in their life. Let me help you. Without private purity, you will never have public victory. Come on. Without private purity, you're never going to walk in a public victory. It matters how we live. It matters that actually this book is not redundant. Heaven and earth can pass away. His word remains the same. Hello. That means that we have to live a separated life. Paul says, would I say that there is no consequence of sin that you would go on sinning? Absolutely not. You'd be bonkers to do that because you disqualify yourself from the abundance and the life, the Zoe life, the John 10, 10 life that Jesus has promised for you. I am amazed how many people in the church do not understand that salvation is not a moment. Salvation is a lifestyle. And we can live under or we can live over. And really the choice is ours. Standards are not something that you live up to. Standards are things that you refuse to live beneath. Because the world has a standard. Social media has a standard. Come on. Secular culture has a standard. And as for me and my house, we're not going down to secular culture. We're not living as the world lives just because it makes economic sense. No, we're trusting God in this season to live righteous. And when we choose to live righteous, all these things will be added unto me. God knows you need a home. God knows you need food. He knows you need provision. Seek first what? The kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. See, what's happened in 2024 is that we've been bombarded on social media, Instagram, Facebook, with a verse of the day and a promise of the day. I wanna tell you today that the word of God is a manual, not a menu. 
That means we don't pick and choose. <laughs> that means we don't say, you know what? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Therefore, I'm going to go to the bar and get drunk tonight in Jesus. We don't do that. Come on. There is a freedom. There is a liberty in Jesus that we can live an abundant life and not go back to eating scraps under the king of the, the devil, under the table of the devil's table. Come on. See, we need to live a life separated. Come on. See, the next thing that Adonai Bezek did was he chained them under his table. He chained the 70 kings and the Bible says he fed them scraps. My fourth point today, the devil, he wants to debase you. What does that mean? He wants to degrade you. He wants to reduce that which God has already provisioned. He wants to chain you under a table. What does that look like? In other words, in a place unseen, in a place of ignorance, where you're ignorant to what God has already provisioned and the blessing for your life. Come on. You see, the kings were in bondage eating less than what they should. Because as far as I know, when I study history, Kings lived in a palace. Hello. A king had a royal residence. A, a, a king had divine provision. Kings were seen as, as, as being someone more than every need that the king had would be provided for. And Jesus says that you and I are kings and priests, a royal priesthood. Hello. See, there's a lot of kings in the church today who are ignorant of the blessing and provision the Bible promises and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. See, the reality is Jesus in the New Testament, type and shadow from King Adonai Bezek, who would keep a king under the table, chained and eating the scraps. We fast forward to a picture that would have been in Jesus' mind that he invites his kings, the 12 disciples, as the king of kings, and he has two things on the table. He has the bread and he has the cup. I love that. The bread, the provision of abundance. The bread, the sustainability of life. The bread, the broken body of Jesus Christ that you and I can walk in healing, not just in our physical bodies, but for some of us today that we could walk in healing in our heads. I pray and release right now everyone suffering under a blanket of negativity, under a blanket of depression, that Father, right now, the provision of the bread, that Lord, there would be healing healing and wholeness in the minds of your people, that they would no longer live under the table, but they would live above the table from the provision of the King of Kings in Jesus' name. If you believe that, give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on. The wine represents his body, his blood shed for us. See, both of these pictures are a picture of divine provision. Stop walking, believer, in fear of the devil. Stop allowing the devil to come between you and it, the good things that God has in store for you. Stop allowing the serpent to kind of come and, 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 and come right in the middle of your faith right now. It's time to rise up in faith. Receive the bread, receive the cup. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was not just for a moment of salvation. Heaven is our destination, but this side of eternity, John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to steal. He comes to kill. He comes to destroy. But I came, provision of the table, that you may have life and life to the full. Come on. God wants you to be a blessed life. He wants you to live a blessed life. He wants you to live above and not beneath. He wants you to walk in freedom, not bound by the chains of bondage anymore. Come on. We need a revelation that that word of salvation is not just about eternity. It's the word sozo, which means holy, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally free in Jesus' name. And so today I want to say, you may be down, but you're not out. 
You're not busted and disgusted, hindered and held back from living the life that Jesus has provisioned for you. You don't have to be dethroned. You don't have to have your thumbs cut off that you wouldn't yield the sword, the promises of God, or your big toes removed, that you would stop progressing on this process of becoming more like the image of Jesus Christ. No, today, God is saying to you, in a season of construction, would you partner with me, the chief engineer, the master builder? Because I want to tell you, church, today that unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. Would you stand with us, church, this morning? The worship team can come up in this moment. In the book of Micah, Micah begins to prophesy and he says in a loud voice, is there not a king in you? Dad, I wanna tell you there's a king in you. Mom, today, I wanna tell you there's a king inside of you today. Sons, daughters, there is a king. Young person here today, there is a king inside of you. There's a revelation in this house today that you are above, not beneath. We will no longer walk in the shadows. We're no longer living under the table when Jesus has divinely provisioned. With every eye closed and every head bowed this morning. Father, I thank you today for this word. I thank you, Father, even in this place right now, God, that you have provisioned, you've provided. And where the devil has made so many people here today think that he is stronger than them, that in this place we are taking back authority. We're taking back our families. We're taking back our jobs. We're taking back our careers. The devil has tried to take the territory in your industry, not on your watch, King. Not on your watch, ma'am. Today, walk in the authority of what Jesus has already provisioned. Father, we will go through a building stage. We will go through a season of construction. Father, we realize today there is no self-made man, no self-made woman. No, we would labor and build in vain. But today, Lord, we're partnering with you Your word says that you and I are living stones, that you and I make up the body of Christ. One can put a thousand to flight, two, 10,000. Right now, there are people around you. I wanna encourage you. So many of us rock up on nine o'clock, walk in, walk out 10.30 by. There are people around you that God has designed and orchestrated a divine appointment, a divine meeting. Like my example, hey, I've just graduated as an engineer. I own an engineering firm. Hey, let's chat. There are those appointments God has ordained in this house today. We as the body of Christ need each other as living stones. I wanna encourage you. God's placed you in a community a phenomenal community that you would grow and become all that He's destined you to become. This morning, I wanna ask you, sir, ma'am, if you're far from God, I wanna tell you your best life starts in relationship with Jesus. Jesus stands at the door of your heart and He knocks. He says, if you would come in, if you would allow me in, I will come in. I will make you come alive again. You've tried to fill the void with everything other than God. He is the way. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life you've been looking for. Today, if you'd invite Christ into your life, your life will never be the same. If you're here today, maybe you did that a while ago, a long time ago, and you've missed the boat, you've missed the plot, I wanna give you an opportunity to respond today. He loves you. He cares about you. So right now, with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you're in this place and today you want to invite Jesus into your heart for the first time or the first time in a long time, I want to pray with you today. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. All I'm going to ask in this moment, so I know who I'm praying for today, 
Would you do a bold step just to slip your hand up in this moment? Once I've seen your hand, you can put it down. If that's you today, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, at the back there. That's fantastic. Is there anyone else in this place? Could you just lift your hand one more time? Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're gonna pray this prayer all together today. Say this, Lord Jesus, I come before you today and I ask you, Lord, to come into my life. I choose you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Forgive me of my sin, my past mistakes, and make me new. I choose to follow you all the days of my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Can we give these two people a round of applause? Fantastic. What an amazing decision, come on. Someone's gonna give you a card if you could just fill that in. There's also a link on the screen right now of just some resources that'll help you on your journey with Jesus. This week ahead, I wanna tell you, if you've given your life to the Lord, is a significant week. Don't lose this opportunity. Press in, God will make you come alive this week. It's an awesome thing. Can we give those people one last round of applause today? Church. In a time of building, in a time of building, let us trust what God's doing. It may feel difficult, but He's doing something. God bless you. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you next weekend. God bless you as you are.